A very good afternoon to you and welcome to this afternoon's webinar with Capital Legacy. I'm James Lennox, the Managing Director of Milk and Sugar. I'll be hosting and producing this afternoon's webinar with two of the powerhouses in the fiduciary and insurance industry. I'm talking about uh, Alex Simonides, the CEO and co-founder of Capital Legacy and the Managing Director of uh, Capital Legacy, Brandon Garbett, who will be joining us this afternoon to chat about all things wills and estate planning. If you go to your, if you're saying to yourself right now, well, wills, I've got a will, then you are one of 30% of the population of this country who has a will, which means that there's a massive section of the population that doesn't have wills. Well, we're talking about the costs associated with your demise and things that we don't like to think about. Now, not necessarily a, a cheerful topic to be discussing in the afternoon, but something that is very topical and important. Guys, welcome to this afternoon's webinar. Great to have you here. Looking forward to chatting to both of you uh, and certainly to finding out about why it's so important to have a will uh, and certainly what the costs uh, are that are associated uh, with wrapping up your estate. Because I think a lot of those, a lot of people perhaps don't understand uh, the costs that are associated. So great to have you here. Uh, just very briefly, while we wait for more people to join the webinar, Alex, tell us just a little bit about how lockdown has been going for you personally. Well, I think it's uh, been a very trying and learning time for, for all of us. Um, I never quite thought I'd find myself lifting weights in a garage. Um, I've certainly extended my cooking skills. Um, but there's good and, good and bad. So I think the bad point for me is that I lost that, that divide between work and home, um, and that, that those lines got totally, totally blurred. So being able to come back to the office has been a bit of a relief. Mm -hmm. But the same breath, I was able to get immersed in my son's homework and get get really properly immersed. I have a very busy work life, um, being the CEO of this business, and I was actually able to get those those half hours with them. So mixed bag of tricks for me, actually, um, as I'm sure it is for for many people. Maybe some people are getting a bit tired of it now, mm -hmm. and have maybe grabbed onto something that's a bit more. They, they enjoy like maybe they enjoy doing the virtual meetings with work and having a bit more flexible time. Um, I think from a business and a personal combination point of view, I'm not 100% sold that we can always be productive by always being 100% at home. Mm -hmm. I'm not over that hurdle hurdle yet. I know many people are saying it, but I think it's too early to to make that call. Mm -hmm. So a lot of question marks, but yeah, it's been, a, been an interesting time. Brandon, how about you? I mean, it's it has been difficult, as Alex has been saying. No, nobody's really enjoying this, but there are some positives that have come out of this. Do you have any positives out of the lockdown? Yeah, so I think uh, James would uh, uh, to echo what Alex was saying. I think we've had to learn new skills. I think for a lot of us, we've had to um, open that tool shed and that uh, garden shed that we never were used to before. <laughs> um, uh, as Alex was saying, also improving on, on cooking skills. Although I don't think my wife would say that I've actually improved at all. But uh, a big uh, negative, if I can say, sort of a positive, was the not having the balance between your, your work and personal life. I actually found that uh, work actually became busier for us at Capital Legacy, actually working from home. And you actually battled to, to separate that, that work from, from home life. Um, and I think that took, took a bit of strain on a lot of the family, especially in, in, in confined spaces. But from a positive point of view, we, we all learned new skills um, from, a, from a personal side and from a, a work-wise. Um, the virtual consulting, which we'll discuss later, sort of became extremely prevalent, especially in our industry, uh, being able to still remain in contact and everyone has sort of had to if you can say, get on board with, with, with uh, your virtual consulting um, and trying to get hold of people through technology. But also, again, to, to echo Alex's point is uh, it, it sold a solution for, for, for a small bit, but uh, I think it's too early to say that this is the way forward, that you're going to be working from home. I think there might be a bit of a combination. I still think that there'll definitely be a place in, in, in the office. And I think you'll start to see that, that sort of certain parts of production have sort of gone down uh, because you kind of lose that energy when you're not in the office. Yeah. But it has taught us new skills. There's one, thing I, there's one thing I'd like to get rid of. There's the incessant WhatsApp from 7 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or the, when everyone thinks that you're always available because you're sitting at home and you can't be doing anything. Well, I see that there are a lot of people joining us uh, from Cape Town, Peter Maritzburg, uh, I see Gideon van der here. That's all in our chat room. Of course, it's great to have you 
as part of this webinar. And one of the things that we do want to do over the course of the next uh, 55 minutes or so is we want to be able to respond to your questions. So do be getting those questions in on the chat section. Trust me, we will try and get to all of them. There's a lot to get through here. We're talking about wills and estate planning. If you've just joined us with the CEO of Capital Legacy, Alex Simonides, and uh, his managing director, or the managing director rather than his managing director, I think probably the better way to say it, uh, the managing we'll director. <laughs> <laughs> we obviously want to try and respond to as many of those questions as possible, but be assured that if we don't manage to respond to them here in this webinar, I know the guys from Capital Legacy will take the time out to make sure that they get through to all of you. So do make sure that you put your, your questions into that chat room. I'll be checking them out and making sure that we get to them throughout the course of this webinar. I want to jump straight in now, now that we are kind of warmed up and have gotten to know one another and feel comfortable again. Alex, the, the obvious question that we need to start with is, who is Capital Legacy and what do you do? So if I had to meet you once off at a coffee shop, I'd say Capital Legacy is all about getting more wills done, but more importantly, getting more wills done that are valid. And then when that will needs to be executed, making sure there's the least or no fees. Um, the idea of the business came from a very real situation that I had as a, as a financial advisor. Um, for those who are listening in, they, they might know what a financial needs analysis is. And it, you, you can be, you can gloss over the fact that you put in 3.5% for the executive fee. And I, I did that for, for a thousand clients until it came time to pay it. And that 3.5% becomes a, a real random amount. And when you need to go to a widow and say, look, we've got the life cover paid out, but I'm going to need a big slug of that to pay for the executive that I hooked you up with. It's not a great conversation to have. That's why I always say Capital Legacy is all about getting the world done, making sure it's valid, and then when it needs to be acted upon, making sure there's no, there's no fees. Typically, um, our sort of peers in the industry, they stop at sort of getting the world done and then waiting for you to die to, to try then make as much as possible. But what makes us unique is that we invented this thing called the Legacy Protection Plan. So it's a policy that goes with your will, and literally it takes care of all the things that are not dealt with between the life insurance industry and the wills industry. So, so what I mean by that is there's a lot of gaps that we saw. So when a person does their will, that doesn't necessarily talk to their beneficiaries on their life cover. When a person does their life cover, vice versa. When they do their life cover, they're only just taking care of maybe their bond settlements or their, or their estate duty, which is not an executive fee. When they're doing their will, they're not thinking about the debts that they need to settle. So what we do, or the, the immediate expenses they need to, to cover. Mm. So what the Legacy Protection Plan does is it fills the gaps, it takes care of the executive fees, provides the services. If there needs to be um, monthly expenses that need to be paid from your state, well, they wind up the state, takes care of that. If you and your spouse both pass away, because we all got it in our will, if, you, if, if I pass away and my spouse pass away at the same time, what happens then? Then it provides a lot of cash. That, so it fills the gap. Mm. And I think that's what Capital Legacy is all about, it's about filling the gap unique as a result of do, do you think it does it surprise you though at this stage that I, I mentioned at the beginning in my preamble in the introduction to 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 this webinar does it surprise you that 70 percent of south africans don't have a will well then it's improved huh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so the stat we usually throw about 80 uh, percent but but i think james it it doesn't actually surprise me um it's when, when we're doing a when I'm doing another interview um People are saying in terms of why is that stat there? Well, just like financial planning in general, people don't really wake up in the morning and go, well, I haven't done my will. We've actually seen the, the, the converse in that during COVID. Actually, people have woken up and said, I actually need to do a will. But generally, people haven't done that. And, and um, I often say that the gender South African market has this uh, Superman complex, you know, that it's not going to happen to me. So I kind of put things off until, until it happens. Unfortunately, you can't put off death until it happens. So um, I think from a COVID point of view, we've actually seen an uptick. But to go back to your question, definitely not surprised that 70% uh, of, of people don't have a, have a will. And remember, it's not just the will, it's an up-to-date and valid will. And I think between myself and Alex, we'll probably touch on what actually makes a will valid later on. Many people think that they have a valid will, but it's actually not. And that's also what we, what we do at Capital Legacy to actually educate you on what makes a, a will valid. So, but, you, but you continue. Right. Um, everything in my mind is is not set up well or enabling the person to get the will. And it's not a South African problem. Mm -hmm. So if you think about it, you've either got to go to an attorney and, and fork out two, three thousand rand to get it done, mm -hmm. take time out of your take time of your day, or you've got to go to your bank on a Saturday, we know what the queues can be, be like then. Um, 
you then are forced to choose an executor. So maybe you can have an uncomfortable conversation. Um, you are literally just given a, a document to sign with no discussion around the sort of playing out of what would, would happen. And really for me, the place where the person who should be doing the will or at least having a hand in the world is the financial advisor. They're the person that's doing your life insurance. They're the person that's taking care of the funds when you die. But yet you go into your banker to do your will or you go into a lawyer who has no idea what your, your life insurance is doing. Um, so it's completely not integrated in my view. And as a result, that doesn't surprise me at all because I mean, there's what, 15,000 life policies being done each month? Yeah. How many wills? Well, and to jump onto that, I think um, uh, Alex and myself, we did a, a session about three years ago. Um, we were sort of educating the, the financial advisor market. And it was called Legacy Lessons. And we sort of uh, coined a phrase called the golden thread. And if you look at what the golden thread is, is we've said, how does financial advising actually work? It should start off at the will. That's where everything should start. And then you go into the F&A or financial needs analysis, which goes into your retirement planning, your estate planning, when you pass away to make sure that, um, that uh, your beneficiaries are paid out. And then to continue past that is to look after those beneficiaries. But unfortunately, not just in South Africa, as Alex has said, in the rest of the world, is generally financial advice comes in the form of when you're doing the financial needs analysis and when you get the beneficiaries. But those other two parts at beginning with the will and the end have generally been neglected. And that's what we've been trying to, to yeah. string together, and that's what we call the golden thread from the world all the way to look after beneficiaries. If you've just joined us, we are chatting to uh, Brandon Garber, the MD of Capital Legacy, and Alex Simonides, the uh, co-founder and CEO of the company. We're talking about wills, estate administration, and succession planning, putting your affairs in order. Of course, we did say at the beginning of this webinar that we uh, really want to hear your questions. And there's one from Ash Maharaj. I'm going to jump in right now, get straight into the questions to, to ensure that uh, we get through some of them. Uh, Ash Maharaj asks this, I, I would like to know if it's advisable to take out a monthly policy policy, so we're jumping straight into the nuts and bolts of what you guys do, uh, a monthly policy with Capital Legacy to cover the cost of winding down an estate, say, of a value of 25 million rand. So, Brandon, perhaps to your point, you were saying, like, the first thing is the will to get that in place. He's talking policies. This may be an opportunity to jump in and start talking about some of the, the nuts and bolts of what Capital Legacy offers. Yeah, sure. So, if, if I may, so on a quick 25 mil estate, you're yeah. talking about People take a million rand just in executive fees. Yep. Um, I'm guessing on a 20, 25 million rand estate, you've got two or three properties. Jeez. You probably go by another two, three hundred thousand in conveyance fees. Because so, everyone talks about the executive fee, right? But everyone forgets about the conveyance fee, the, the cost to transfer that title. Yeah, so, so to just jump in there on, on conveyance, which a lot of people actually don't realize what conveyancing is. Often the uh, properties are held between spouses and it's 50 50. And you know, you talk to people and they go, oh, but if I pass away, it's just my wife will take over the, or my husband will take over the other 50%. But you actually have to transfer that 50% over, which obviously an attorney has to do or a conveyance has to do. And there's going to be a charge for that. And that's where we talk about the conveyancing fee. And then if, if uh, it was an Ash, if Ash also wants the, his legacy, to, maybe he's got some young children that uh, are going to inherit that legacy, there'll be a technical trust that we create. Now that's really where the big costs start ratcheting up. So if that trust is going to run for 10 years, you're looking at about another one and a half million in, in fees. Yeah, no, and that's never disclosed in the will. Yeah. It's never, ever disclosed in the will. Um, and this is what we talk about when we go see a client. We do the will and we do the calculation of the fees. So we can convert it from this percentage to this, this real yeah, value. Yeah. So to ask this question, is it worth it? So that particular kind of need would be uh, what we call our down policy. Yeah. That would be, depending on this age, would be just under 180 rand a month. Depending on the yeah, so depending on the age, anywhere from 180 to 220 rand a month. 220 rand a month, and that would provide them three million in in protection against fees. So you would think, wow, that's that's a no-brainer. How is that possible? This must be smoke and mirrors, right? But that's what makes Capital Legacy. That's what makes us unique. That's our, our secret sauce. See, we're actually not a life insurer. We're a fiduciary services provider, and because of that, when we issue the policy, we we are accountable for our own cost of wine at the state. Now, trust me, the, the cost you actually want of us as a state is not three million. Mm -hmm. It's way, way, way less. So when he takes the policy from us, we actually only insure ourselves on what it really costs us. So us just getting that benefit. That's uh, certainly one of the things that I would imagine would be one of the unique selling points to use that sort of typical marketing term, if you will. So it must be one of the unique things that you offer amongst many. Uh, I see there are a couple of other questions, Dominique. I'm going to come to your question in a minute, uh, Dominique in Cape Town. But I guess one of the things that we've been talking about here and perhaps avoiding the fact that we are in lockdown, 
one of the things that your, your clients and your brokers may, may have done previously is obviously have these face-to-face -face meetings. That has not been possible during lockdown. What have you guys done to, to help brokers along, particularly because I know I'm sure there are a lot of brokers watching this at the moment. How have you managed to help brokers uh, sort of manage this process of lockdown and, and getting will signed and getting will sorted out? Yeah, so, so James, this, uh, this whole COVID obviously struck everyone um, by surprise. And as you alluded to, we've been very, very successful in that personal touch. We've been dealing with with a face to face consultation with clients. Um, so the brokers have obviously trusted us with their clients that we obviously go out to um, and we can go and sit in their convenience, whether it's at home or, or at the office, and actually go through the actual will with them and make them feel comfortable um, so that they obviously have everything everything set. And that's what we've been doing for the past seven to eight years and, and working well. COVID obviously hit us and obviously everything had to change. And luckily for us, we actually we worked a lot of technology um, that would actually allow us to do what I call virtual consultation um, with an actual client. So through either telephone, uh, your, your different platforms such as Zoom, such as Teams, we've been able to still engage with clients. We've still been able to draft the will in consultation with the client. We've been able to show them uh, what Alex was, was talking about, now the fees that they would incur if they would have passed away. We were able to actually get them the will um, by technology for them to actually view and to know that they actually are comfortable with what, we, with what we've done. What it's also done is it allowed the, the advisor to carry on with his practice. A lot, of, a lot of advisors are going, well, now what do I do? I can't see my clients. I'm not technology savvy. How am I going to look after them? Mm -hmm. And what we've actually done is we allow the platform for, to, for the advisors to still send us their, their, their clients, mm -hmm. um, especially in COVID where the world is very vital, and we've still been able to engage with the clients. What we always do is we bring the advisor in. We always keep the advisor up to date. So that whole contact, we kind of uh, networking between the client, the advisor, and capital legacy. And, and, and we've learned a lot of lessons um, with, with regards to technology. So we were lucky enough to put it quite quickly. Speaking of technology, there is a poll that is available in this webinar. We'd love to hear from you. We will release the results of the poll a little later on. You'll see in the chat section uh, a little icon that says polls. And the question that we are asking uh, you to, to respond to is, do you know how much your executive fees will be when you pass away? That poll question again, do you know how much your executive fees will be when you pass away? That poll is uh, live now and we will give you the results of that poll at the end of this webinar. Uh, Alex, one of the things that I'm aware of is that, you know, you can go online and sign a will and it's, you know, there are a couple of places that you're able to do that. Uh, what makes what you do unique? Why, why would clients and brokers come to you directly to, to, to sign their wills with you? Well, up until about two months ago, we offered the face-to-face -face consultation. That consultation, which we've now been able to virtualize, and I mean, just, I know that one of the big themes of the uh, webinar that we're doing today is about how we adapt as a business. We were able to turn that around within a week. Right? Yeah. Within a week, we managed to get 100 will agents able to, to do virtual consults, um, as if we were as if we were doing face-to-face. -face. But to to answer your question, why, why does it matter? So if I'm online, I'm doing a will, and I see the question, do I use a testament to trust? I'll say no. Oh, but there's an info button that says maybe you should have one. I've got minor children. It's an absolute that I need to have a testament to trust. But I've got no one at the end of the line saying, no, you actually should select that, Alex, because you don't know what you don't know. So the service we offer is that we make sure that we catch you, okay, as much as we use technology in our business. I mean, we produce 5,000 wills a month. Of course, we use technology to do that. Mm. But we use technology to create a bespoke personal service where we've heard you as an individual client and made sure that you don't fall into a trap or an unintended trap. Mm. Because really with the world, you only have one chance to get it right. And we don't want to be the ones to have that on our hands if we've got a problem. It sounds like you've simplified the, the process quite a bit from perhaps other institutions that offer maybe a similar product. Uh, but apart from simplifies, simplifying people's lives, Brandon, uh, you've mentioned a little earlier on, you may have mentioned incentives. You offer incentives to, to help your brokers and therefore pass that on to their clients. What are some of those incentives that you are offering? So, so when we talk about incentives, we, we, I would like to just separate them. What have we been doing in terms of incentives for the actual customer, in other words, the end client, and what have we been doing for the actual broker? If we look at how we can assist the, the client in, in this uh, time, what we've been doing is we're saying to them that you were used to us coming out from a face-to-face -face perspective, and what we've done now through technology, 
uh, we are able to still consult with you from a virtual consulting or telephonic um, setup. What we've also said is we've actually brought out a specialized product to look after you with uh, unlimited fees during this time during lockdown, which we very successfully. Um, as well as on the public sector, we actually brought out a campaign where we're actually looking after those public sector members that are on the front line. That was a special campaign. So from a customer point of view, we're always trying to, to incentivize them to make sure that they've got the will in place. Like you said, 70% of people don't have it, trying to incentivize people to make sure it's in place. From a financial advisor point of view, financial advisor has always been the, rock, uh, the cornerstone or, or the rock of what Capital Legacy has been built on from a distribution perspective. And we never want to actually leave that. So what we've said to advisors is, we said we actually understand the hard position that you're in. None of us have actually experienced any of this in, in, in our lives, and we're actually all learning together. But what we said from our point of view is, we understand that there's a contact um, uh, hardship, as well as from a financial hardship point of view. So what we've done over the last sort of two months is we've assisted the advisor by saying, we still will assist you from a virtual consult consultation, where we get hold of the client, and we still obviously offer the will, um, and the client's looked after. From a um, commercial point of view, we obviously said to the advisor, we want to look after in these hard times. There are certain campaigns, such as um, a debt relief campaign for, for advisors who have a debit balance with us. We've obviously given them um, a period to that we sort of uh, don't actually have to call any of that. It's a bit of a relief for them. What we've also done is um, the financial advisors out there will understand when I talk about the renewals, we've allowed renewals to, to for the advisors to call in their, their renewals early, that when you're supposed to come later in the year or next year, they can call in them now to get them through the hard times. And then finally, from a will drafting perspective, we incentivize the, the advisors who are drafting the wills that there's a will drafting fee uh, that they can actually um, sort of uh, incur as well, that we can help them while they're helping their clients get the wills up to date. So as I said, we've tried to in these hard times, try and look after the, the, the client to say, that yeah, we're going to help you. As well as from the advisor point of view, we understand that there's hardships and we, we, we sort of we sort of in this with you. We, we're in the trenches with you. Before we get on to uh, how that affects clients, direct clients, there is a question from Dominique in, in Cape Town, and it's an interesting one uh, that speaks directly to Wills. My parents were married in communion, uh, community, I guess she means community of property, and have a joint will. Uh, my dad passed away in 2015, and my mom needs to thus update her will. Okay, please advise on the best way to proceed. So her parents were married in community of property. Father died in 2015. It's time for her mum uh, to update her will. What is the best way forward for her? Well, because we've got a bit of time, maybe just share a little bit of information on that situation. So when you have a joint will, it really is just two wills on one piece of paper. The will of her father is now at the master's office. Her mom's will is still bad, but it might not be correct in terms of what she wants. So the easiest and quickest way to, to get it done is to reach out to Capital Legacy to get a new will done. When she does that will, she will put a sentence in that says, we will revoke the previous will. And then this will will come into being. And then she can sign it. And then whatever she wants uh, in terms of her legacy now post passing of her spouse can be done in that will. Another question, and I want to bounce off this just because, it, 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 to my mind, it relates. That Jan for Mark asks, how do you get the will signed in compliance with the Wills Act? So Dominique was asking she needs to update her will. Jan has put the, the focus on what happens now during lockdown if I need to have a will signed? How do you do that in well, compliance? This is, this is the crisis we were dealing with. 100%. So this, this, we were dealing with this exactly two weeks ago, and about two, three weeks ago. Yeah. So the, the problem with signing the will, and we did a lot of petitioning with government, yeah. and we said, please, because the will, in essence, has to be signed with a wet signature, I meaning you have to print it and actually sign it. It needs to be witnessed also in a wet signature. And those witnesses can't be your, the people who are inheriting from your estate or who you want to uh, execute your estate. So now, obviously, if you sit in the house and the people who you are inheriting are the people in the house, you can't get them to witness. Maybe you don't have a printer. So it was, and we petitioned government to allow us to do electronic signing. They had their hands full, obviously. Yeah. So what we actually came out with um, is that we create what's called the will sign benefit. Now, in reality, what happens in South Africa is if you, have done a will and you haven't been able to sign it properly, meaning it's it's printed or maybe not printed, maybe you signed it electronically, maybe it doesn't have the correct witnesses, maybe you've done one of those digital signatures, you're able to approach a high court and you're able to say, this is the valid will, okay, upon the person passing away, and please accept it because it's got the following um, affidavits and supporting circumstances. Now, Capital Legacy, we've dealt with about 37 of these so far. Yeah. 37, the cost of it is about 30,000 Rand, 100% success. 
There's a hundred percent success. The problem is it takes some time and it costs money. Yeah. So the time, the time we can't solve. Time we can't solve, and also the, the the cost. So now, now if that happens, you have to go back to beneficiaries and say, we can try and get this uh, will through, but there is a cost to this, and people, are, it's it's hard cash. So the beneficiaries have to come up with a thirty thousand rand. So what we've done is we've created a, a universal feature in our product called the will signing benefit, and it releases thirty thousand rand upon the passing of anyone who's done their will during this time in COVID nineteen and hasn't been able to sign their will properly because we back the high court process and we'll provide the 30,000 Rand to apply and get the will accepted. It, it, it leads me into a question which was not part of what we planned. So hopefully you guys are going to be able to respond off the cuff here. It, James, it, this isn't part of the script. Oh, right. Sorry, that's strange. <laughs> Hang on. One of, the, pay you <laughs> one of the things that fascinates me, particularly with describing what you've just described, is that you guys don't stop innovating. You, you, you're not one of those companies that has a product and goes, this is the product that we're going to market continue. What is it that drives you to continue that innovation and to continue to offer new products? And I'm asking you, Alex, specifically because you are one of the drivers of the R&D department in Capital Legacy. Uh, what, what, what gives you that motivation to do that? I think because it's a constant learning. So we're, we're the same company that does your will that will ensure your policy to take care of the fees and the people you want at your estate. So what happens is this circle of learning. Because when we get to the estate, then we learn something new that we may have overlooked in the product. And we're in the constant pursuit of the perfect solution for the client. So, so to, to give you an idea, when we began the company, we had a, a basic legacy protection plan. We completely overlooked things like estate overheads. We completely overlooked uh, the very small chance of it happening, but it happened nonetheless of two spouses passing uh, away together in a, in a, in a car accident. Um, and then on the ground, when things like this, this will signing problem happen, we continuously look at what we've learned from our 37 cases and how we can use that with what we, we know, because we don't believe, I believe that you retire when you think you've got the perfect product. Mm. Yeah. Because you don't. And, 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 and I think also just to maybe add to that is, what we do is we, we constantly listen. So we're not one of the, the, those kind of companies that are, we know everything, this is how it's going to be done. Uh, we're constantly listening from um, our advisors, we're constantly listening from our internal staff, from, from customers. And we, as Alex said, th those are real problems that people are experiencing. You only get one chance to get it right when it comes to to the will and, and all the expenses occurred when uh, or occurring when you pass away. So we're constantly learning and we constantly want to innovate to see how we can solve these problems on an ongoing basis. We do cause our CFO grey hair because our approach um, is to what's the problem? Here's how we solve it. So our, our CFO and our actuary, and then we go do the solution, and then they they kind of come to us and they go with us. This is going to cost X, Y, and Z. So myself and Alex often call them like the naughty school. <laughs> I want to move this forward a little bit. You mentioned twice uh, the legacy protection plan. Uh, and I, I think for those people who don't know anything about capital legacy, you might be going, well, what on earth is the legacy protection plan? And what is it? How is it going to help me uh, in this process of uh, my, well, my state administration, my succession planning? What's it geared to do and how does it work? So first and foremost, it gives you uh, services. Um, those services have zero cost on the initial charge. And then when you pass away, those services are indemnified by what we call the indemnity benefit. Then indemnity benefit, we've got a whole range of, of cover amounts depending on the size of state. So you heard when Ash, when we had Ash's question, we referred to a certain plan up. And then after that, we've got a feature called immediate liquidity. What we experience is that when a person passes away, even if they're well off, there's this immediate need to fly people in, to not just pay for the funeral, there's other incidental costs. So we've got the release of immediate cash. To, to, to the family, and then the, the product then also has a thing called state overhead protection. The reason why we have that is when a person passes away, you've got things like the master's fee, advertising fees, you've got to do your last tax returns, um, will sign. Uh, there's, there's a whole lot of hard costs that aren't part of the executive fee, so the, the plan also, remember I said it fills all the gaps, so the plan also takes care of that. Um, it can also then be extended to take care of the children's medical aid, children's school fees, the short-term insurance, because what really happens when you pass away, is if you miss one school fee, we know the story with schools now that if you miss one debit on a medical aid, no one's insured. So that's why we've got that bit. And that was also from a hard lesson that we, we learned. We actually had those problems in the estate. And the last one is if you and your spouse both pass away, we've got a release of, of the exorbitant amounts of cash because that's when you've lost two breadwinners. Yeah. Fantastic policy. I want to jump into to, uh, one of the questions here from Narina Austin, who asks, most people's estates are not big enough to be able to, co to cover the costs of a testamentary trust. How do you overcome that? I'm gonna throw that to Brandon. Oh, well, we'll throw it to you, Alex. There we go. Yeah. To you. So, so 
doing the right thing shouldn't be inhibited by the cost. Mm -hmm. The legacy protection plan takes care of the executor, conveyance, and trustee fees. So there's actually no reason in our world for you not to do the right thing and create that testament of trust. Because the fatal alternative, James, is that if you don't do it and you've got cash for your or inheritance for your child, then it's going to go to the government's guardian fund. If it's a property, it's going to be locked under, under custody. Mm -hmm. So that or the cost, and if you've got a solution to the fee, why not? Yeah, so, so I think, James, and I think what Alex was leading to for, on the LPP side, and then obviously for, for, um, for the, the clients who's emailed us there, is that's what I talked about, that golden thread, where we've done a lot of financial planning, and it's just that middle part of the golden thread. We haven't actually looked at what happens beyond when a person passes away. We've already sort of done financial planning up to when the person passes away. And what Alex has alluded to there, especially in our state's overhead uh, protector and the state gap cover um, elements of the legacy protection plan, is we look past death, how do we look after the, the beneficiaries? So as Alex said, we look after things such as if you have a state's overhead protector, pay for school fees, your medical aid, um, all those sort of, those need to be cost checks. Don't think when you're actually doing your financial needs analysis, yeah. just think they're going to be taken care of. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then especially in terms of the, the state gap cover, which is to go after you if you were to pass away together. But to go back to, to the question there, is the legacy protection plan, you say you might not be able to cover the cost. That is why we actually have got this in place because the testament trust is post death. We won't need to go after those beneficiaries. And that's what I talk about that golden three bank group. But to your question, her trust might be small, the premium might only be 80 random. Yeah. And that, I guess that's, a, that's a, a key point here is that you determine the policy de dependent on how much people can afford, which again is, is incredibly useful. And, and I think, don't know, what's really important is when one of our, our consultants uh, go out and actually draft the world for you, and we actually run through the actual costs. When you look at that, as Alex alluded to in the beginning, in the old days when you look at it, it says 3.5%, that actually sounds very little, okay? And the testamentary trust, you're looking um, at 1% to initiate and a 0.75 ongoing in terms of the assets. It's something that that's actually not bad, but when you actually do the calculations, you see a RAND value, and that's what the question was about, mm -hmm. is it can run away with you from costs? And that's what we actually show you. And from there, we determine what is actually needed from the plan. So don't try and oversell your product. We actually say that's exactly what you need, and that's what we match you up to. As I said, it can go from 80 rand to um, to Ash's question, which would have been about between 180 and 220. Got a question here from uh, Kanyiso, uh, and it's quite a long question, but I think it it certainly presents a problem which I think you guys would be able to 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 answer directly. Hi, I'm Kanyiso from Johannesburg. In the case of marriage of community and property, I'd like to find out whether a spouse is able to claim from a will that they are not mentioned in. We're in a case where uh, he explains the whole thing. So just at that point, let's try and answer that question first. If somebody's not mentioned in the will, uh, married in community or property, are they able to claim against that will? So it's something that we, we encounter every every day where people try to disinherit spouse and, and children, James. Um, so there's actually two answers to that question, if I, if I may, for, for the audience. So the first part is, he said uh, married in community or property. That marital contract is cast in stone. Um, that entitlement to 50-50 of each other's in community estate is done. There's nothing you can do in terms of changing right. changing that. The second part is what if they weren't married in community or property, but they were still married? Hmm. The spouse would, even if you don't put the spouse in the will, the spouse will still have what we call a marital claim. Okay, and the executor has to, well, will receive a marital claim guaranteed if um, that person has disinherited them or not, but then in their will. So when our consultants sit with the, with the clients, we try to talk them through this situation. I mean, everyone's got their, their own situation. It's not a bad or a good thing. Um, so you say, look, you're not going to be able to disinherit, yeah? Um, could you maybe give some of your life cover? Because then that takes care of that, that marital plan. Mm -hmm. um, very interesting example of, of the situation was our own Nelson Mandela. So he was married in community property when he passed away. And if anyone remembers correctly his, his little clause he put in his book. Because remember, he was a very clever attorney. Yes. He actually was. He was a very clever attorney. And his clause said, um, I will honor the fifth in community claim, but I'll ask you in front of the whole nation to renounce your entitlement and take this. Right. And so he set a platform up to say, I'd rather give you this, but just get out of the, the marital plan because I want to do this for everyone, for everyone else. So it was a very clever clause that he put in his as well. So I hope that answers your question, can you? So I, I know that you gave a lot more information uh, that, and a lot more complexity to your case, but I think that that certainly does uh, cover uh, some of it. I want to just quickly draw, jump back to, to wills because as a business, a business is, uh, operates to make money. 
you guys don't charge for wills. How on earth do you make this business work? <laughs> you go for it. Yeah, so you get this asked all the time for the past eight years. It's come. So there is no smoke and mirrors. And the one thing about your living company is we're very really honest and upfront with them exactly how, how, how the, the, the business operates. So from a will perspective, um, if you need to have a will done, we will come out to you at your convenience, uh, whether it's your home, whether it's your office, um, sort of day and night, we, we, we're available even on, on by the time of the weekends, and we obviously draft the will. There is no charge for the will, there's no charge for safe keeping, and there's no, no charge. You don't appoint the executor. Yeah, there's no charge for, amend, for amendments, and you don't even have to appoint us as the executor, yeah, which is a big point. Wow, I mean, that, that is a massive point. I mean, it's like, where's the benefit to you then? 100%. But what we're actually saying is how we've changed an industry that we, we don't just do the will, mm. like Alex alluded to in the beginning, where he said what a lot of our, our peers have done is they draft the will and then they're hoping for you to pass away and then charge you um, large fees to, to wind up their estate. We said we actually want to turn it that on its head. And we said we're going to tell you up front, these are what your fees would be if you were to pass away. Mm. What we can do, because usually people get shocked by that when you convert that 3.5% conveyance and testament to trust into grand value, and we say this is what it'll cost you from a premium point of view. Um, on a monthly basis. But then when you pass away, you know that these fees are taken care of. So if you intended to leave 10 million to beneficiaries, it's not going to be 10 million less cost, it's 10 million because you've got this, this policy in place. And we and we, you said, where do we make our money? Is we obviously do it from a policy point of view. Um, there's obviously margin built and like any insurance product where, where that's where we, where we uh, make the money. But in saying that, even if you don't take a policy with us, that will is still free. And the reason we do that is because we believe that we offer such a good service that even if you, when you were to pass away and you haven't got a policy, but you still need to wind up the estate, you'll still come to us for us to obviously wind up your estate. We obviously, we, we charge fees at a reduced rate because we've obviously used our company to, to draft the will, so you get a discount immediately. And we like to think our service has put us in good stead going forward. Here's an interesting question just on the topic of, of uh, Wills. Elmin Poles asks, are your wills consultants registered fiduciary practitioners and qualified estate planners? That's quite a mouthful. I'll read it again. Are your wills consultants registered fiduciary practitioners and qualified estate planners? So we've got three roles in our business that touch clients. So we've got the will consultants who go out and see the clients. Um, to your question, the kind of person who's needed to do estate planning is not your 10 out of 10 client. It would be your, your 1 out of 10 client. So our typical wills consultant that goes out won't be going to go see that client. Um, they'll be there to go see the other nine out of 10. The person who simply just needs to give everything to their child and the trust of their spouse, then their spouse to a trust and point is to get it done. For that one out of 10, we've got another one in our business called succession plan. And that's a very high end bespoke service. You may need things like an interview with trust, offshore structuring, very clever clauses in your will to mitigate um, the liquidity constraints in your estate. And then when it comes to actually winding up your estate, we have estate administrators and estate consultants, and they're all registered with the Fiduciary Institute of Southern Africa, and most are most of our attorneys um, as well. I suppose it goes without saying that during lockdown, uh, even though you can have the choice of which legacy protection plan uh, you, you decide to take, uh, things are a little bit difficult for your own consultants to meet face-to-face -face, uh, with their clients. Um, what, what, what are you doing to kind of mitigate this and to help People's, your own people stay in touch with their clients. So Brandon mentioned it earlier. The, the solution we came out with um, at the sort of onset of, of COVID-19 was an unlimited fee product. We've always had a, a, a high net worth individual product called the unlimited, and that literally covers your fees no matter what your, your worth is. And so you wouldn't need to do a calculation. Again, from our learnings, we transferred that to this time. So to save the need to do a, a cumbersome calculation of all your fees that you, know, you really need to do face to face, the product is automatically unlimited for a period of six months, and then we can extend that if we see which way it's going in terms of the, the various lockdown levels. And then when we can actually come and sit with you, we can then take you on to the, to the right amount of cover based on the, the calculation. And it's anyone's guess when this thing's going to end, so the unlimited will continue until we can get to yeah. see you. And, and I think the reason we did that, James, is people kind of running into a bit of a panic mode. They weren't really kind of thinking, thinking straight. And what we said is, we want to actually make sure that everyone's covered from a will perspective and make sure from a fees perspective. Um, and this made it very simple and, and easy. Someone knows it's a quick 45 minute call with, with Capital Legacy, I know my will's in place, and I know if the worst was to happen, I've been actually taken care of from, from, from a fees perspective. The, the thing we said when we were putting it together was the last thing we wanted was someone who actually needed 
700,000 having found the thousand, and now all of a sudden the 200,000 shortfall. Uh, short so mm -hmm. we just made it under the two. Just a reminder that we are running a poll which we for which we will give you the answer or the results rather at the end of this webinar. So on your chat section, you'll see a little tag that says polls go there. Uh, the question that we are asking is, do you know how much your executive fees will be when you pass away? Uh, some interesting results coming through there, quite a high percentage or a percentage that may surprise you seem to know what they're likely to be in for. But of course, we'll give you the results of that poll uh, a little later on. I want to come to uh, another question here, uh, putting you on the spot to figure out how much costs will be involved. Penny Nidy says, asks this question, can a 220 Rand policy take care of a 25 million Rand estate uh, and conveyancing worth 2 million Rand? Yes, well, it, it can. It just depends on if there's going to be a testament you trust or not. But just if we're going on the conveyancing and you know what exactly the 220 Rand will cover that, that starts estate. You're prepared to stake a claim on that. That's brilliant. Okay, so we have another question uh, that I'd like to throw out to you. Uh, uh, this is a, from a 73-year-old, Kenneth Greeny. I do have a will, but no life cover to cover costs of my estates. I guess the question that he's asking there is what, what happens in that kind of situation as a 73-year-old? So he's got a will in place, no life cover to cover the costs of the estate. What, yeah. I think a uh, yeah, good opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> so again, we come back to this thing learning. So when we started the legacy protection plan, we, we only showed people up to the age of 60. But then this kind of question yeah. happened, and especially from our clients who are taking the point, well, what about my parents? And the problem is life cover is just too expensive, yeah. uh, too expensive for, for, for a 73-year-old. Um, it probably wouldn't even be worth it. Yeah. But then let's just jump in. Remember life cover, you, you have to have sort of med medical testing and underwriting done as well. Mm. So most people um, at that age 73, as Alex has alluded to, it's expensive uh, beyond affordability for, for most people, as well as having to go through underwriting, which most people probably fail. So, so what we invented was we took our legacy protection plan. Now remember the legacy protection plan, a part of it, indemnifies or uses the cost of our own fiduciary services. Okay, But we took up all the other cash or life cover benefits, and now we're able to offer a product to the plus 60 market that's simply 137 Rand a month. It doesn't go up according to your age, and you get 90% of your fees taken care of, not underwriting. Really? You took out the problem of the life I certainly hope that that helps you, Kenneth. Uh, certainly getting advice from the experts for free. It's kind of the way that we do things here. Bruce Manson asks, and this is going to actually lead quite nicely into my next question, is that he asks, as a financial advisor, I try to make provision for the estate costs when I do planning for my client. How would this impact the legacy protection plan that you would offer my clients with Capital Legacy? Do you want me to repeat that or I'm maybe good. you've got no, that? Okay. No, good. So I come from a background using multiple FNA tools. Chances are you would have only entered the executor fee. So in that particular case of the question, just means there's going to be more cash available to the family in terms of what you plan for if you've taken something in conjunction with the legacy protection plan. But the software that's available, Bias, at work, the various live companies, yeah, software, yeah. two questions they never ask. Conveyance fees, testing trust fees, and we found that those are actually the two biggest fees. The chances are the FNAs are the lowest. Uh, and if I also, also want to jump in there, a lot of advisors, and I mean, we deal with, we've got over four, four and a half thousand advisors registered with us. There's been a lot of good work out there from an FNA perspective. And a lot of the advisors say to us, but we have actually put in, in place for those executive fees. The difference, though, is, and, and I always talk, to, uh, my business partners hate me for this, but I always talk about, like, let's talk reality instead of, uh, you know, instead of scenarios. And when you pay that money out, to actually then go to a family and say, you've been paid out the, this amount of money, um, but their fees can have some of the money back. They're not aware or thinking at the time that this money I need to keep aside for the certain fees I need to be paid. You don't about the FNA. Yeah, you don't about the FNA. Well, your husband said, actually, this money is actually earmarked for this. But the rest is, is, is we do to, to live with. So what, what we do from a capital legacy perspective, if you're doing the LPP, it actually takes a conversation away because you're indemnified of the fees. So the life cover in place, to do what's intended to do, to look after the, the, the spouse and the family going forward, we want to look after the fees. As I said, even if a financial advisor has actually put that in place, it's a difficult conversation to say to the spouse, we are paid, but it was actually meant for something else, can we have it back? Yeah, never never an easy conversation to have with anybody. No. I want to bring this back just a little bit to, to uh, your brokers who you form relationships with and, and obviously incentivize them and help them. One of the things that you've done to, to help them during the lockdown is you, you have, I, I, it's not a word I want to use, but if you 
you've got a LinkedIn group that, that you've got, you use WhatsApp. Just explain a little bit more about how you are working with your brokers to help them still meet the, the needs of their clients. So, I mean, Dave, myself, uh, you and myself had a, had a uh, conversation about three, four weeks ago about what we're doing from a capital legacy perspective. And everyone says, well, people have got a lot of time you know, at home, especially during lockdown, to say, well, you know, we'll send out communication. But for me personally, I mean, I get probably over three, four hundred emails per day. If someone's sending me an email, it's sort of just another kind of email in my inbox. And we really wanted to reach out to, to their advisors to let them know that we're here, we have to assist, we want to, we want to sort of help them and their, and their clients. So we obviously try to use different types of technology. So um, as many of our, our advisors will, will, will know, we use things such as videos. Um, we're really reaching out to the advisor with uh, our videos in terms of information sharing. We're reaching out to them in terms of on the different uh, social media platforms. We've launched uh, campaigns that have been running uh, during COVID in the last two months, which are, which we really leveraged off on social platforms such as obviously your Facebook and LinkedIn. We've just recently launched our, our closed LinkedIn page for financial advisors. And that's a page that we actually want to sort of share some industry knowledge with. We want to create a bit of chatter going amongst advisors. But I've been sitting at, at home for two months now. It, it, it can be a lonely space. And we want to try and encourage um, engagement with, uh, with us and with other financial advisors. So definitely from a social media point of view, we, we, we can say up to our game. Mm -hmm. um, and also with things like videos and, mm -hmm. and webinars that like we're currently doing now to try and bring the, the industry and advisors closer together. The, your industry really is built on, on relationship uh, and communication is key. And I mean, you've certainly indicated here some of the things that you're doing. How, I guess at a, at a personal level, how difficult has it been to, to kind of pivot into this new kind of way of doing relationships where it's virtual rather than face to face? Yeah, so. Sorry? You're not a broker. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, the, the guys battle. So I remember it was, it was what's those dates? The 27th. It was exactly two months ago today that everyone started working at home. Remember lockdown happened okay. at midnight on the 26th. It was so amazing. That first day was gung ho. Everyone was taking photos of themselves, working at the desk, working in their lounge, the patio, and you started to see that sort of sort of uh, falling away. Um, but what we what we did do in that time is we were quick to pivot. And as I said, through technology, it wasn't just us dealing with the end client. We um, internally set up a lot of groups in terms of being able to be in contact. So our internal staff were having daily um, or biweekly meetings whereby we've still been in contact, we're still sending out the information, we're still making sure that, that the advisors are taken care of. And then kudos to our, to our staff, our broker consultants, who were in constant contact with the advisor. Mm -hmm. um, and we were we actually teach a lot of our advisors, actually not just from a fiduciary perspective, but from an IT perspective. Click there. Yeah. <laughs> your, some of you on the phone going, yeah. so that button to the left of that button, <laughs> click on that, and then you can see me, and, you know. So it, it was a whole education process, and I think it's been very successful. Um, nothing will be face-to-face -face, uh, in, in my perspective, but we did pivot quickly, and I like to think, by and large, we've actually tried to engage our, our broker force and, and keep them up to date through these technologies. So, so, sorry, sorry to quickly, but the one thing we, we sort of admitted that we did do, I think, well, we did a lot of things badly, but we did a lot of things well, is that our existing clients, so if you call into one of the call centers now, you're generally going to get a response saying, because of COVID-19, expected late service, and the service is really good to begin with, now you just got an excuse for it. So, so what we've really been successful at is if you call in, if you need service, if you need update your will, if you've got a claim, anything like that, we've got no slowdown in our, in our turnarounds, we've got no slowdown in, in storing the wills and retrieving them and answering any questions. Literally on the 27th of March, we, we flipped open the laptops and everyone was live in their homes. And I think it was quite important we did it, how we did that was, it wasn't just from a, from the sales perspective, I don't mean sales, but a selling perspective, it's dealing with the end client. Mm. Um, it wasn't just that in terms of the will and the legacy protection plan and what our consultants actually go out and do, but it's actually the administration side, which a lot of companies actually have fallen short of, is we were quick to pivot from an administration point of view, like Alex is saying, we could still help you from a will perspective, we could still um, help you from a, if you're battling from a premium perspective. Uh, so we kept that whole, that whole engine going. Uh, it wasn't well, let's see what happens in lockdown and we'll get back to you kind of thing. 
I want to talk in a minute just about, we've talked extensively about what you've done for brokers. I want to talk uh, in, in a little bit about what you're doing for your clients, but I want to jump in on this question. We're running out of time for you to still post your questions. Don't forget that uh, we will try and respond to them all post this webinar. I know the guys at Capital Legacy love to hear from you. Uh, your lease asks this question, can the content of a will be contested and after how long? So contents of a will are contested and Company like ours that do between what, 70 to 90 new estates a month, we, we see we actually see it a, a lot. Um, there's there's a more prescription period that, that law uh, affords, but I mean that's I think going to take five years. Um, so really, I think it's not about the time period. The question is, can the contents of the will be contested? Yes. Are you going to be successful? Is the, is the next question. So there's various things you can fight it on. So was it signed? The person being of a sound mind. Was it signed validly? Was it signed under duress? Meaning that the person could have gone your head and make you make you sign but if you're trying to contest the actual contents of the will i don't see how any and we've, we've experienced this i don't see how any judge is going to say no that the sign for it so you're you really going to contest the legality of how it was was signed and if it was signed with the right uh, state of mind mm -hmm. and under the right uh conditions um, like i said with the previous question with the uh, disinheritance of a spouse or child if you've done that then you actually are afforded the law uh, claims regardless of contesting the will. And often we've actually sit with clients with this exact same thing, so don't contest the will, exercise your right. Mm -hmm. I want to uh, come to the poll. Of course, uh, you've been great in answering our poll question, which was, do you know how much your executive fees uh, will be when you pass away? Uh, the answers that uh, our, our uh, viewers could use are yes, somewhat, or no, I need your advice. Any idea, putting you a little bit on the spot here, of where the uh, hammer fell? I know, given the audience. Yeah, given the audience, I think that it's, it's going to be quite a bit more educated than we actually thought in terms of an educated guess in that. Or they're just cheating using their blueprint planner that our consultants use when they go and see them. Uh, I'll go 40%, I know. It, it's pretty good. Look, it is incredibly high. It's a lot higher than I certainly expected. The yeses of those who know what their fees will be, their executive fees when they pass away, will be 53% in this poll, which is incredibly high. Somewhat 26%. Yeah. And no, I need your advice, uh, 19%. So to those 19% who have no idea, let me suggest that you get in touch with Capital Legacy very, very quickly so that you have an understanding of what you're likely to be paying uh, on the demise of the loved one or what your estate is is worth. These guys are brilliant in being able to, to help you sort that out. So that's the result of the poll now, 53% saying yes. I think we'll keep it open for a couple more minutes to see if it changes in any shape or form, but I think that's pretty decisive in that there are a number of people, uh, perhaps brokers who are watching this, who work with you. We'll have to find that out, but there you go. That's the poll. I, I wanna come back to asking what kind of how are you helping clients in this time what sort of incentives you spoke about brokers and how you're helping them what sort of things are you doing for your clients well the first thing we did was we made it categorically clear in a video i can mm. mention that you're covered for COVID 19 because mm. you know you, you've got this thing that deals with your with your with your mortality um doesn't actually cover you for the thing that we're all locked up so that was the first thing we did we gave assurance that um you are covered for it and even if you take one of our new policies you're still covered covered mm. for it the second thing we did, and we, we spent a bit of time on it, was uh, the, the will sign. The whole thing comes to naught if the, the will is not signed properly, and we've engineered a way where you can still at least get some semblance of it being uh, signed correctly. The, the big thing for me was not necessarily on the client to have a will and a policy with us, it was the work we did with the families in the estates. Right. So we've got about 1,000 estates yes. open. I mean, it was so, give, yeah. give or take 3,000 families who are waiting, waiting on us. And what happened, James, is that the master's office is closed, the dean's office is closed, mm. everything ground to a halt. Now we've got people who are waiting for property to transfer. They maybe had a sale in process. There was liquidity constraints. Um, so the first thing we did is communicate. communicate, communicate. communicate. We couldn't mm. get letters of executorship. Mm. Yeah. Um, so the first thing we did was communicate, 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 make our estate administrators and consultants available to the families uh, in hand-to-hand -hand sort of combat because it's, it's such a tense time for this to, to actually um, happen. And then <laughs> my, my business partner here, Brandon, uh, alluded to the big truck. So we made all our administrators really focus on getting the letters of executorship and all the documents ready. So that as the master's offices opened, we literally did have a truck in all of our all of our regions, and we went straight to the master's offices with the head of the queues to get all the stuff out for the for the families. Um, and I think that's on the ground stuff that we did. Yeah, as I said, it's administration side that we actually didn't miss a beat as well. 
you know, people have gone through hardships in terms of losing a loved one in the last sort of two to three months. Mm. And then all of a sudden you can't, nothing can happen. And, and it was no one's fault. But people just love to have communication. And our administration was always on there for communication. And as, as Alex said, as soon as those, uh, those government institutions opened, such as master's offices, we, we were there. Um, we were always in contact. We knew when they were opening in different regions and we were there and we put out the communication to those families, which I think was extremely important. Time is starting to catch up with us, and I know that uh, we have let some of the brokers who are watching this know that there are some new products that are in the pipeline for later on in the year, not only for brokers, but also for uh, your your clients as well. Uh, this is the moment, I guess, that if you've been waiting for it, this is the moment that you've been waiting for, and we are about to reveal some of those great products that you have lined up, because as I mentioned earlier on, innovation is probably at the heart of what Capital Legacy does, listening to what clients' needs are. Uh, Brandon, I'm going to ask you to, to maybe outline uh, just some of the products that you have lined up for later on in the year. So, we won't really allude to what the actual final products are because obviously there's certain um, um, sort of testing and, um, and sort of marketing behind the scenes and finalization. So I don't want to give away too much, let's be honest. Of course not. No, no. But, but you, you want to keep people hanging on. I want to keep people, but, but they're all very exciting. Let's put that out there. They're very <laughs> innovative and exciting. But what I can actually say is, is, is I think where we've actually been really, we've been good and we've been lucky and prudent is from an, uh, an executive level, we actually had a plan that was, that was put out in January of what you want to achieve in the year. Not just from a, from a commercial point of view, but from a product, product launch point of view or, or bringing a product point of view. And um, I can safely say that we actually not falling behind that plan. The plan is still in place. We, we're still exactly where we want to be from a month-to-month from a -month point of view. And we, we're on track. Um, to, to come up with, with Would you be willing to give up one half secret of one? <laughs> and you're being pressed here by your CEO at the such. <laughs> we can, we, we, we we'll can, give, we'll we, give one half secret. We can, we can give a little so one, one of the things we stumbled yeah. on is that the Islamic or Sharia market is, is completely mm -hmm. underserved with a, a complete solution from mm -hmm. world to state to making sure that there's a Sharia compliance insurance. Mm -hmm. um, so I'll leave you with that. Let's just say we've tackled that whole big problem and we've got something that's They've been seen before in the country. Fantastic. Well, there you heard it first here on this webinar. I, I guess, yeah. So, 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 I'd just like to say is, is whatever we do from a capital equity perspective is we never actually want to follow. Uh, we'll never, we're never going to be one of those companies where, well, we just add on because it's the thing mm. to do. Mm. We, every single product that you've ever brought out, every single type of service, it doesn't always have to be a product, it can be a service that we're offering. It's always going to be unique and it's going to appeal to a problem that we've actually found mm. and we actually want to solve. And, and, and I think if the, if the audience can understand that it's always going to be something that we've identified, something unique that we want to help. Yeah, I guess one of the things that, 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 that is so exciting about what Capital Legacy does is, and you mentioned it earlier, Brandon, is that you listen. You see what's going on in the market, and I think you also mentioned it as well, Alex. You, you watch what's going on in the market, and you respond to stuff as it's required. So you're always solution-driven, and as you say, nobody likes to, to follow. You are industry leaders. Uh, we, we're kind of getting to the end of this webinar. Alex, I want to just ask you something here. How positive are you about the future of not only your own business, but just where we are as a country? And I know that's a big question. Uh, and uh, and I also accept that you probably won't have the complete answer, but I know that you are always thinking ahead of the game to try and see where things will go. So how are you feeling about the next couple of weeks and perhaps the next couple of months for, for this country? Not the answer you want. Not good. Yeah. Um, I'm worried deeply about the third round effects on, on the property market, um, and that's a selfish point of view for our business. But on the first hand point of view, I'm worried about the, the run at the restaurant who hasn't eaten or got food or money for the last two months. Um, that'll have run. I'm worried about the middle income market, who the hairdressers and and the restauranteurs and the travel agents. Um, I don't have a good answer for you. I don't think this this is going to end well. Um, I don't see. Uh, that the we've had enough fiscal uh, help, and I don't think there was much ability to give fiscal help. I don't know what the answer is, but it can't be good, in my opinion. I don't think it's going to be cataclysmic, but I don't think it's good. Well, possibly not the answer that you wanted to hear today, but let me just say, gentlemen, it's been a fascinating discussion. And uh, even though I've known you guys for a very long time, there's stuff that I've learned today. So I certainly hope that you sitting at home watching this, thank you so much, by the way, for taking out time in your day uh, to spend time with us, to find out about uh, your wills, your estate administration and your estate planning or your succession planning. Uh, I certainly hope that your uh, 
um, affairs have been put in order. Uh, I think just to, to, to wrap it up, um, uh, Brandon, for you, what does the future hold and, and how are we going forward here? So from a future perspective, uh, I mean, as Alex has said, there's, there's going to be a lot of work uh, going over the next year and for probably the next two to three years on from that. I don't see it being a, a positive end to 2020, especially with the different rules and regulations. But it's one of those things is, is you've got to be resilient. And um, what we're trying to do from a capital legacy point of view is we're actually trying to say, what can we do to improve the industry? Because if we improve the industry, we're going to improve the economy. So from our point of view is we're still, as I said, forging ahead. We're trying to look after the role players and then the role players, I'm talking about the financial advisors um, and obviously their clients to see how we can actually get through this tough time. Um, as I always said, it's, uh, you know, we, we're trying to create a bit of certainty in, this, in these uncertain times. Um, and hopefully by the end of 2020, we can come out of this and start building uh, this, this, this industry and the, and the economy because we need it and there's no other choice. Um, it's not going to come from from the fiscal side of things, as Alex said, I don't think we actually can even afford it. So it's going to be us trying to, to drag ourselves out of it. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. It's been an absolute pleasure chatting to you. And of course, if you don't have your uh, will sorted out, uh, let me just press that button, there we go, as we produce this. If you don't have your wills uh, sorted out, Capital Legacy is definitely the company to get that sorted out for you incredibly quickly. If you don't have your affairs in order, maybe this is the time that you need to be thinking about how to get them in order. And there is certainly really only one name in the industry, to my mind, uh, that you should be talking to. That's Capital Legacy. I'm James Lennox, the Managing Director of Milk and Sugar, who's been hosting and producing this webinar for Capital Legacy and for Mail and Guardian. It's been an absolute pleasure having you on board today. I certainly hope that you've learned something. And don't forget the Capital Legacy. If you want to reach out to them, get hold of them on their website. If you have more questions, they'll only be too happy to answer them. You have yourselves a safe and fun afternoon. Thank you.